Asalaamu Alaikum everyone and welcome to session 9. So as you know we were looking at section 2 of Dua Iftitah and now we have come to a really special one which is the role of the 12th Imam, the role of the Imam you know who is the Imam of our time. And the first question we wanted to look at was uh, the first question that's put down there which is why is the coming of the Imam so important for the believers? Why is it important for us to be in a state of Wait, why are we waiting? What are we waiting for? What is this? You know, we're hearing a lot about being in the state of intivar, but what exactly are we waiting for? I feel like we're quite susceptible to just wait and not know why we're waiting. Yeah, exactly. You know, we know that we're waiting, but what is, and we know who we're waiting for, but yeah. why are we waiting and what are we waiting for? We're not sure often. Yeah. And actually, when we started looking at this, the, we realized that we may think we know, but actually let us assess our intentions behind waiting and some of them may be a little bit more selfish than than what we realize um so there were four reasons that has been given in the tafsir of this dua why we wait for the imam one is actually when the imam comes with this is really interesting wasn't it Fatimanti? when the imam comes our daily needs will be met very easily. Like uh, the term used as salawati, we'll recite the salawat and our daily needs will be met. So for many people, they might be waiting for this because there will be ease. They won't have to work so hard and struggle for it. Yeah, for the people who are struggling in their daily bread, in their daily life, you know, the grind, which is too much and they cannot cope. The imam is a way of, well, all of that will be relieved, you yeah. know? Yeah. yeah. Then second, uh, the Imam will come to set right affairs and remove problems, um, you know, and, and so if we are struggling in, in whatever sense, maybe family issues, maybe societal issues or whatever, you know, maybe even illnesses, all the rest of it, when the Imam comes, uh, you know, we know what we think that he was going to set right all these affairs and these problems are going to go away. Yeah, even it's a bit like, you know, our social responsibility of making sure everybody's on the right path and you know Amr bil maruf nahi munkar it'll feel like that burden has been relieved of our shoulders so yeah. much because now the imam has come he will be in charge of that yeah. and that is a huge responsibility too so to want the imam to come for that reason is, is quite you know it, it seems like a big reason as well doesn't it yeah because we do feel the weight of okay you know we need to ask for people to do the right thing or remind people and stop them from doing the wrong yeah, and it's a wajibat, so really we, it's something that we should be very much concerned about. And then when the imam comes, we will not have to be so concerned about that. Well, will we? <laughs> <laughs> and the third reason is the removal of tyranny and oppression. And I think this is probably one of the bigger ones that we think of. Oh, there's injustice in the world. I mean, if we think of what's going on in France right now, or Palestine, or Yemen, or any of these places, we, you know, hope and pray that when the Imam comes, injustice will stop, tyranny will stop, and the establishment of justice will be there. And the fourth reason is the victory of truth. You know, um, Islamic divine laws will be implemented worldwide. The, the, there will be a revival of the Sunnah. There will be no more disbelief. There will be no more polytheism. There will be no more hypocrisy. And that, uh, when we actually examine it, what they say is the first couple of reasons are not the right reasons to be waiting. Yeah. The one main reason that we should be waiting is for this last one, which is the ideal uh, uh, reason of the victory of Islam and the victory basically in essence of truth. And the reason why this last reason is the most important is because if this last reason is the real reason and the true reason and it comes to fruition, then all the other three reasons why we are waiting for the Imam, so namely, you know, our own experiences, social responsibilities and social justice, and then, you know, social justice on a wider level, everything will flow from that victory of the truth. Everything will fall into place. Once prophetic traditions are being implemented, once everybody is on the same path, then all the things that we are worried about will not be a worry because it will flow through that, that, that truth that will be recognized by all. You know, it will permeate, that truth will permeate into every levels of society. So domestically within your, you know, within your cities and your towns, and then globally, it will be something that will flow through every vein. And so all the problems will be solved that way, which is why the main reason we need to be waiting is for this just, this victory of the truth. 
And we actually pray for it in a very clear line in Dua Esprit Santo. Yeah. Line 188, we actually say this real reason for intihar. We say, Oh Allah, we earnestly desire from you an honored state through which you strengthen Islam and its people and degrade hypocrisy and its followers. And we were saying, weren't we, Fatima, that if we do have the earlier reason, then if someone comes in and, and, and helps us in that, then we start, you know, we, we won't necessarily wait for the imam anymore. So let's say we want social justice. And, you know, we wanted, for example, Jeremy Corbyn to come in or Bernie Sanders to come into government. And we, we felt like, oh, once they come in, they will make things more just for people. Yeah. Then would we stop waiting for the imam if that was the case? And you mentioned something about isms, didn't you, which was really... Yeah, so like, you know, all the different, if you just think back to the history of time, like the last hundred years, we have all the different, you know, socialism came before that communism came, you know, now capitalism is here and we feel like that is the solution. But in actual fact, time tells us that it's, it's not the solution, you know, although at the time we feel like that might be their solution to our problems, but it is only through this honoured state that, you know, everything will be resolved. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this next question, actually, um, not next question, we'll go to uh, the lines 214 to 219, because that fits in really well. It says, what personal changes do we pray for in this section? So if we look at 214, okay, we say, oh, best of all who are asked and the most generous of bestowers, through him, cleanse our chest, remove the stains of anger and hatred from our hearts, and guide us to the truth on disputed matters. By your permission, surely you guide whom you wish to the right path. So these things, three things, if we look at it, cleanse our chest, remove stains of anger and hatred from the hearts. By the way, a quick point on stains. Stains are not just anger and hatred right now. Stains are like things that have been done in the past and maybe not been sorted out and left a mark. <coughs> we have these old marks of anger and hatred in our hearts, as well as the new ones that we make. Guide us to the truth. And when we ask ourselves, why do we pray for this? It goes back to that point you made, Fatimanti, about how our responsibilities will be alleviated. We think that once the imam comes, we won't actually have to do Amr bil ma'roof and nahyan al munkar. But that's not the case, is it? No, because this is sort of, so once we figure out why we are waiting, now we know what we need to do whilst we are waiting. Yeah. So you know, this is all our training ground, our preparation. This is what we need to be doing as we are waiting, you know, as we are consciously waiting. Because once the imam comes, mm. things won't happen automatically. No. It's not like we can just relax. Actually, people will need training. They will need education. They will need to see what true Islam looks like. Yeah. And we need to be those role models. We need to be at the forefront and invite people to the imam, to the truth, to Islam, through our words and our actions. So that's really, really important that our duty then, if we are in the state of intadar, we are basically muntadirin, those who are waiting. And our duty then, as muntadirin, is to know the truth and to act on it as much as we can. So looking at this anger and hatred, for example, how can we invite people to the love of Allah? And the, the, the beautiful love in our faith, if we have anger and hatred in our hearts, it's just not possible. So we need to be actively working on increasing our knowledge of our faith and, and, and then improving our actions so we can really be there, ready for the imam when he comes. And just on a practical note, China, you know, when we say anger and hatred, it's not like we're going to go out and vent our anger to the world or anything like that. It's our little practical habits at home, you know, how calm are we, how quick to react are we, you know, how, you know, how um, amiable are we with our siblings and our family members, especially in the month of Ramadan, that is, that is the simple level of this anger and hatred that is being talked about, mm -hmm. you know, in our personal lives, in our homes, in our daily interactions, how calm are we and how are we able to sort of, you know, digest information before we kind of spit out what we want to spit out and hold our tongue. These are all the practical steps that we as Muntazirin should be focusing on. Otherwise, it's just lip service, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And actually, we have examples in our past of people who've done lip service. Mm. But when the moment came, they mm. didn't actually follow through. So Prophet Musa's time, for example. Mm. The people, uh, you know, the Israelites at the time were waiting for a savior. Mm. 
they were wanting people, uh, a savior to come and help them and save them from Fir'aun, save them from, the, you know, they were being, sla they were held as slaves and, and all the rest of it. Then a savior came. They saw miracles in front of them. And yet when Prophet Musa went up for, for 30 days, they st or 40 days rather, it ended up being, they started worshiping, you know, a cow again and they turned their backs. Exactly. Even, you know, the people of Medina who were waiting for the Prophet, yeah. when he came, they saw him, you know, he, he, he explained everything to them, but still then, you know, they were not ready. They could not accept him. And you it's, know, it's not just one. Yeah. It's yeah. time and time again, the time of Prophet <laughs> Imam Hussein, yes. when they called them to Kufa and then they turned their backs on him, you know. <laughs> just so many times we have this example. So we need to ask ourselves, are we going to be like that? Where we're going to give lip service and say, yeah, we're waiting for you, Imam. And then when the Imam comes, we turn our backs on him. Yeah. I guess what you were saying, you know, you had a point about forming a personal relationship with the Imam. That would really help, wouldn't it, here? Yeah. So I yeah. think the point was basically, especially going back to last session, where mm -hmm. we looked at how we are in utter need of the Imams, like our material needs, our worldly needs, our spiritual needs. The Imams have sacrificed so much for us mm -hmm. and we hardly think about them. And, yeah. you know, we know that they see our deeds. We know that they see our, um, they feel the pain of our sins or when we turn away, uh, not even our sins, our, our ignorance or our not paying heed to them. Indifference, indifference, indifference not caring, yeah, not caring yeah. about it, yeah. So the least we can do is be aware of them and, and you know, try to establish a relationship with them. And that's as simple as just doing what's right, you know, doing, trying to do the right thing, trying to improve ourselves, remembering him, at, you know, with a salawat, remembering him with a two rakat salah. Or even that salam in the morning, just, you know, that would stop that indifference. If we can, you know, say salam to him every morning, then we are acknowledging him at the start of the day. We are not being indifferent to him, are we? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the last question that we were going to look at is the reflection. And we were talking about what is the relationship between the 12th Imam and Ramadan? So why is there such an emphasis? Because a big part of the Dwayf Tata, a big chunk of it is on the 12th Imam. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we remember him in Ramadan in particular. Um, I, think, I think the link would be that um, the month of Ramadan is... It's that link between what are we meant to be doing during this period of intadar. And we know we've just said that it's all about self-building and working on ourselves and, you know, preparing ourselves. Yeah. And the month of Ramadan, these 30 days, Allah has given us perfect opportunity to kind of look inwards and perfect ourselves. So it's a bit like, you know, this is the 30 days. This is your training period. This is your period that you can inculcate, inculcate new habits, you know, get rid of bad habits. And then the point is that after the end of the month, we need to continue that and we need to keep on with those new habits and you know the vices that we've gotten rid of they need to be kept out yeah you know? and um we had that lovely example of a firefighting like you know a firefighter who who trains for a certain period of time you know fights fires in his training goes through everything that he needs to and then when he's done and he's qualified that doesn't mean that that's it that means then that when the real fires come he is able to implement and he is able to show that what he has learned yeah. So that's a bit relevant to what, what, you know, the month of Ramadan is for us and our self-building and, you know, the except, you know, the, the extent of effort we need to make for ourselves during this month and then to carry it forward. Yeah. And that will hopefully be our, you know, us being Muntadirin, us waiting for the Imam. Inshallah. Yeah. Because I think, you know, like you said, it's, it's, yeah, you've said at some point, it's not like a light bulb. No. It's not something we can switch on and off. It's something that we have to slowly train ourselves for. The sad thing is, month of Ramadan finishes, and we're back to you know all the usual watching the stuff that we're not supposed to, talking to the people we're not supposed to, and that's not the aim. The aim is to keep those habits up. And so I think one thing we can do is start at least having these small habits that we can maintain, not like having you know suddenly Ramadan is a 360 per a degree change, but little changes that we can then establish onwards, which I think yeah. is, is key. Yeah, definitely. I hope you guys found that as interesting as mm -hmm. we did. When we were researching this, we yeah. really loved this section. Yeah, on it, really on it. it really made us think about our own responsibilities during this time of Intadar and whether we are the true Muntadirin uh, of the Imam. Inshallah, we pray that we all 
can implement something small in our lives that we can maintain even after Ramadan to be true Muntazirin of the Iman. Yeah. Inshallah, see you next time, guys. Yeah. Here, yeah. Glafes. Glafes, Glafes.